Great, great. Well, thank you, Paul, for the introduction. Yes, my name is uh, Melissa Lane, and I am with the uh, American Public University System. I serve as the uh, Associate Vice President for uh, Research and Innovation. I also serve as Editor-in-Chief for three uh, academic journals, one of them being uh, the International Journal of Open Educational Resources. Um, so I would like to plug that journal. <laughs> um, if anybody would like to uh, submit their papers uh, uh, from the uh, conference, I would be uh, happy to, to receive those. Um, uh, you can uh, submit those to mlane at apus.edu. I, um, I also am on the, the board of directors for OE Global. I'm very proud, of, proud to work with some amazing people. Um, and this, this conference is just incredible. Um, I, I put on a conference Oh, it was about three weeks ago, it was a space conference and we were so unsure about having to do it virtually and it just went off without a hitch and this one is too and so it's it's wonderful. But um, thank you so much for, for taking the time to attend um, our presentation. Unfortunately, my colleague Don uh, won't be able to join us today, um, but he will be with us in spirit. Uh, all the way from Romania. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, and uh, Don is uh, in, uh, he's a global higher education consultant. Um, he specializes in open and distance ed, um, and he's based in, in Romania. And I'm sure many, many on the, uh, on the call today here uh, know Don, many of us do. So the title of our presentations, From the Margins to the Mainstream, uh, Culture, Context, and Collaboration for OER Transformation. It's, it's not only a, a, an overarching high-level one. Um, conversely, it's, it's also uh, more of a grassroots one as well. And so I'll explain this. So as we know, and, and we should be very, very proud, um, the OER community as a whole has made remarkable achievements over the past 20 years. Um, OER awareness has grown, OER programs and initiatives have grown and, and much, much more. Um, and as we also know, institutional policy is, is an enabling factor for academics. Uh, to contribute their teaching materials as open educational resources. Um, and, and similarly, uh, organizations such as UNESCO have put their considerable support behind national level OER policy uh, initiatives. The Hewlett Foundation and even the US Department of Education have all funded um, multiple projects designed to write and enact OER uh, related projects as well. But while we've made progress um, and these developments are positive, however, it's, it's not really been near what we had hoped for. And if you holistically look at the priorities of in uh, the 2012, 2017, and 2020 by UNESCO, they haven't really changed all that much. Our, our presentation suggests that OER appears to remain, uh, for the most part, on the margins in educational systems, and its impact or, or lack thereof is, is influenced by political and government changes. And, and there are reasons for this. Um, that I mentioned before, and that reside at a more grassroots level. And so let's take a look at the academic con context and capacity building. So going back to uh, grant funding, for example, uh, the OER movement has, has really been dominated by 
foundation funding, like the Hewlett Fanda Foundation, Mellon Foundation, Ford Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, even the US Department of Education, they've all been priming the OER pump with, with grants. Um, and although incredibly helpful to institutions and organizations in, in getting OER projects off the ground, it's, it's important to note that these institutions or that these foundations, they each have their own distinct identities and uh, philanthropic mandates um, that shape the programs and conditions by which OER funding is provided. So funding awards um, are, are not provided in a, in a no strings attached fashion. So foundation grants are, are awarded to initiatives that essentially support the goals uh, of, the, of the foundation, I'll be, I'll be blunt. It's, it's worth looking at the context around the foundation's mandates and goals. Um, when thinking about the extent to which um, they match up with the goals of the higher ed institution, whether that be at the university or the college, um, vocational school. So for example, let me put this into context, um, the Hewlett Foundation, so it's based in um, Menlo Park, California, it may makes grants to solve social and environmental problems uh, in the US and, and all over the world. Um, the Hewlett Foundation, along with Mellon Foundation, they were the first to support OER and they provided large grants um, uh, and continue to, to play an active role. And all of these foundations, um, you know, he Hewlett is, is by far the most influential and largest in investor in the OER field. And they've been very generous, um, no doubt. Um, we're, we're eager, we, we realize we're, we're very eager to start OER programs and initiatives, but we, we also need to stop and keep in mind that when we apply for these, these grants and this funding, the purpose of the grants must also fit the institution's needs. So our suggestion to understanding this, this academic um, context is, oh, and I had more bullet points, um, but I'll just verbalize those. Um, a successful and sustainable OER policy, it depends upon the type of academic institution. So, so take a look, look closely at the characteristics of the, um, of the institution. Is it a four-year research university? Two-year community college, vocational. Is it a research university? Um, are there strict institutional policy structures? Um, is it collegial, bureaucratic, or more managerial? Uh, do faculty have more autonomy over their courses and creating their courses? Um, will the academic institution allow for the sharing of content. That's also something to, to keep in mind. Do they have adequate funding mechanisms to sustain the OER program? These are all questions, very important questions. So it's evident that when we have any discussion of a policy intervention, we must start with an appreciation of institutional cultures into, into which it would fit. So this caveat doesn't obviate the need for some form of appropriate uh, policy to exist for OER activity to proceed at an institution, but it suggests that a number of other factors 
might in fact have a greater impact on motivating academics to use or contribute OER than policy. So now let's take a look at academic culture and capacity building. So this is another grassroots area where we fall short. Uh, of course, we all want to save students money by using OERs in the classroom. We want to retain students and give them a chance to persist along their uh, academic pathway onto attaining a degree, certification or other. And we want OER programs that are sustainable. Um, but these, these are end goals. Um, these are just some of the end goals. Fa faculty members uh, may not share the same OER passion that, that we do, unfortunately. We, we think that everybody does, but that may not be the case. <laughs> um, we, we sometimes think, well, why wouldn't, why wouldn't faculty not want uh, to engage in OER activity when it's for the greater good. Um, but not, not everybody, oops, sorry about that. Not everybody does. Um, faculty members, they listen to their peers most of all and, and find some key uh, uh, ambassadors who have influence um, this is just a suggestion are there that are also playing around with the OERs and who are admired and respected by young faculty. Um, faculty might enjoy positive policy, financial, technical and legal support and an in-house repository to upload and, and share their OER. Um, however, faculty do not necessarily view these institutional policies and support mechanisms as necessarily motivating factors for, for OER activity. And motivating is a, that's a key, a word um, that we really, it's been a challenge to um, figure that one out. Uh, because again, uh, many times we're looking for our faculty and, and others, we're looking for some, some kind of compensation where they're thinking, oh, well, what's in it for me? And here we have some, some suggestions. Well, so faculty are motivated by tenure and promotion, which is attained by research and, and publishing. So the same um, cannot be said, however, regarding OER activity where there's very little pressure to contribute. So this fact partially explains the, the relatively low levels of OER contribution um, at the university. Although I will say that that is, that is growing as well. Um, I noticed even with the journal, um, there are a number I have no shortage of articles being sent to the journal. And these are incredible research studies uh, that, that are very well thought out and very diverse. Um, so it is growing, no doubt. Um, but to get there, we, we must first look at the academic culture of an institution, their attitudes, scholarly attitudes and, and behavior are certainly shaped by um, institutional policy structures and in, in which they're situated. Uh, they and also uh, impacted by social departmental and disciplinary disciplinary norms and expectations um, or the culture really that defines their workspaces and, and networks. Um, that is beyond policy and governance issues. Uh, academics occupy a social world among peers. There are typical reference groups for judging their own actions who may exert diverse forces on them uh, regarding whether they should share their materials with their colleagues or openly even with the public. 
um, whether they should develop their own teaching materials from scratch um, or incorporate open materials into them as well and so forth. Um, in some institutional culture contexts, this often ends up um, being the space in which the motivation for their activities are uh, derived. Um, so there's, <laughs> there's an old saying that's, that uh, it's easier to move a cemetery uh, than a faculty member. Uh, so we start by, we should start by putting ourselves in a faculty member's shoes. And by really truly getting to the crux by asking questions um, that you would likely ask if you were a faculty member, what is in all of this for, for me? Will OERs help my research? Can I make external connections for grants, projects, joint faculty initiatives? How will I be supported? Um, how will OER initiatives be supported and by who? Um, these are just a few questions, but these are questions that they will want answered and it comes closer to making them feel more comfortable with, with OER activity and engaging in OER activity. Um, when you address any faculty concerns about a proposed OER program or initiative first, that is the um, that's the first few steps that need to be taken. Now, this may not be the degree of motivating factors for OER activity, but simply as factors creating the conditions necessary um, to allow them to act on their own personal volition regarding OER. So thus, really in, in this instance, while we, we really must acknowledge the important role that structure plays in enabling OER activity, we, we will have to look beyond it if we hope to understand what actually motivates faculty to contribute to OER. So now we'll take a look at academic collaboration and capacity building. And I'll, oh, and I know I need to, to hurry up here. Um, there are many OER projects that are boldly taken on by individuals with good intentions. Um, there are, uh, however, for faculty and institutional uh, buy-in, the entire campus has to be involved. Um, OER efforts are taken on either by individuals or small groups. Uh, this perpetuates uh, OER unawareness, uh, facilitates slowing of OER campus-wide acceptance. It stalls development and ultimately st uh, sustaining an OER program. So our suggestions to understanding academic uh, collaboration uh, is the effort made OER, not the responsible of individual faculty, but again, would like to reiterate a campus-wide responsibility. So we take a look at things such as um, reeling in a center for teaching and learning. And I know this is probably named um, uh, various things in various universities and colleges. Uh, across unit, cross-disciplinary coordination um, bring in advising, uh, registrar, library, bookstore, IT, and, and even research and evaluation. When you encompass all of these um, entities from the, from the whole campus, this is where you're going to get buy-in. Um, and everybody can get engaged and then hop on the OER train and uh, things tend to go a lot smoother that way. And uh, you have more, um, more opportunities for, for growth and for sustainability as well. Um, so really to be integrated into the mainstream, these institutional processes, we need to harness the, the true potential of OER in our transformation process. And 
really get to the grassroots of, of the problem, uh, of this uh, making OER uh, awareness, furthering that, um, that initiative and, and making sure that the academic culture is maybe not changed, but is, is modified in some way to, to make faculty and others within the department um, culturally aware of, of, the, of the benefits, not only to the students, but the benefits to them. And that may not be a survey, that may be uh, taken from uh, focus groups even, um, I would even suggest that, but <clears throat> then make it a collaborative effort. Uh, that is, is also key in, in making transformational uh, change. Uh, are there any questions? I'll open it up to the uh, participants to feel free to ask your question directly. Just click on your mic and you can ask Melissa anything you want about this. Um, maybe I'll ask a question, Melissa, while we're waiting for people to think about questions. Um, in, in my work, I often see two different views of open education. One is that it's sort of a small incremental change, like you're saying, you're not trying to change the culture. It's just kind of modifying it to integrate open education resources into it. Others though think of open education as quite a systemic transformative agent, you know, requiring or possibly uh, best enabled through big change. And I can, I can see from your remarks that it, it, it at least appears in your context that it's more of this smaller incremental change rather than transformative. But I, I wonder if you could say a few words about that. You bet, um, because this was a debate that Don and I had. Um, <laughs> and this is very interesting because he had my, um, we switched, we switched opinions on this drastically. So in the beginning, when we were talking about this presentation, I was like, well, you know what? We need to mandate OERs in every college and university, just like we do masks. We need, we need to make everybody wear masks. We need to make everybody use OERs. <laughs> and, um, and then he was like, well, you know, Melissa, let's, let's think about doing this, uh, you know, in a gradual way. Virtual way, and then we met in the middle, and uh, and that that seems to make the most sense because it really does start with um, with taking a look at those different characteristics of a university. Not all the not all of the universities and colleges are the same. We know that, and so um, and that plays a big part. Uh, I didn't even realize when I was doing research on this that the grants are tailored toward certain institutions as well. And, and that needs to change. So yeah, think that answers your question a little bit. <laughs> Interesting. Um, there's, yeah, there's a few other questions. So I'll invite Maria to ask her question. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I think it did a great job of outlining um, how to leverage existing relationships. And I do find that often there are just individuals or small groups that are managing it. And then when the funding runs out, it kind of takes a break. Um, but it doesn't mean that people stop using open pedagogy or open ed practices and so um, I just had a question about how to imagine further collaboration with, say, IT, because I can definitely imagine bookstore, registrar, and I've started trying to establish that dialogue with student support. Um, but IT, I haven't thought of, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, with IT, um, 
The only thing that I had in mind with, with IT is any tech, technical infrastructure where you would need help, like with a repository or with, um, with any kind of technological advance, uh, advancement, uh, such as uh, one that uh, Paul and I and, and others, we've talked about with a repository that matches um, goals and objectives in courses uh, using artificial intelligence and other uh, new emerging technologies that IT would have to be involved in as well. Um, so it may not be, IT may not be an immediate uh, need, but I do believe that having their buy-in um, and others may agree, disagree, but I know at my university, they're always, they always seem to be a have to in any project you do. <laughs> you have to have their blessing on anything that we do. Thanks, Melissa. Sean, do you want to ask your question? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, I, I really resonated with your idea of um, faculty motivation. And uh, I was wondering, do you think that OER content mechanisms and tools pr provide enough recognition and visibility to content authors? And if not, how can we enhance this? You know, that's, that's a good question, Sean. And I've been ruminating on that for a long time. Um, I think that recognition, uh, yes, faculty need to be recognized. I think that would be a, a motivating factor uh, whether that's through um, a marketing department or through um, just to be acknowledged by the institution uh, at a greater, higher level is, is important. But also, to me, one obvious way in which um, recognition could be sought is in tenure and promotion. Um, and that, that whole antiquated uh, uh, structure needs to change. The motivation right there would be in incredible. That would be a huge change and would uh, really uh, catalyze uh, faculty to not only create content, but to peer review content, and then also to research. It almost kills three birds with one stone. Does that answer or did I totally miss the mark? <laughs> no, that's great, thank you. Thanks, Sean. And, Thanks, Sean. and I would add that um, I, I do think it's interesting to consider whether, I, I think it would be ideal if faculty could see the equivalent of citations for their OER, like who's using it and how many uh, different faculty have adopted and modified my OER, how many students are re recipients of my OER. There's really no, yes, of course, the CC licenses provide and require attribution, but there's no tracking of that. And so the creator never knows who's actually using it. So I, I think that would be better. Um, That's Melissa, I'm gonna, uh, yeah. And I think metrics, uh, you know, developing metrics to, to capture that would be, um, that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's next on your to-do list. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I wonder too, Melissa, this is another question from me. Um, when it comes to motivation and the what's in it for me, I, I wonder if it's really that hard and whether we can't just simply modify job descriptions to say this is part of your job. Oh, well, I don't know. I think that might be along the same lines as um, well, this is a mandate now, and this is, you have to wear a mask now, and this is just an added thing that you have to do. 
and you might be teaching a thousand students in uh, five or 10 sections of um, intro to biology, but you, you need to do this too. Um, I don't know that that would go over very well, but um, I, I don't. I don't think that would, I, I think there has to be um, a really creative way. I think this really requires outside the box thinking. And with, especially with the, the research universities, I really think that going back to the peer or the uh, tenure and promotion, I think that that helps that. But then, then again, going back to the context of the university, the various types, well, what if you're not a research university? But if you're a community college and you have a bunch of, you have adjuncts, what's their motivation? Yes. That becomes an even more, more of a challenge so that's the that's the that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good to put your finger on this culture piece. Are there other questions from Melissa? Last call. No. Nope. All right. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. It's always a pleasure to hear from you, and I think that exploring this context, culture, and collaboration for OER transformation. Such a great topic. I appreciate you bringing it forward to OE Global's conference, and it's a delight to see you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Take care.